Australia is getting ready for war. And it has some of the most powerful allies you can imagine. US Congress has passed legislation allowing the AUKUS deal to go ahead. Allowing the sale of AUKUS nuclear-powered submarines to Australia. The US will share its highly classified nuclear submarine technology, making the UK and Australia the only two nations to ever publicly receive these systems. With trouble brewing in its region, Australia has made deals with the US and the UK to obtain nuclear submarines, missiles, and a partnership similar to NATO. This makes the already tense situation Australia has with its enemies quite fragile and truly terrifying. Over the past few years, Australia has gone to great lengths to increase its military presence and budget as it prepares for what feels like is a coming war. Against whom you ask? Well, against the big bad dragon of the East. China is accusing Australia of attempting to stoke domestic nationalism. Australia, in its decision to stand up to other nations, is engaged in a conflict with China. I think there was something like a 13% increase in defence spending over the forward estimates. China is seeking a network of military bases. We are going to have to deal with a much more full-on and powerful Chinese military presence than we ever imagined. For the first time in its history, Defense funding for the 2023-2024 annual year has exceeded $50 billion. Yes, you heard that right. That's the capital B for billion. What that figure also means is that just over 2% of Australia's entire GDP is now being funneled into the war machine as the land down under prepares for the future. If you think this is all, wait until I tell you about the quantity of the nuclear submarines the F-35A Lightning aircrafts, and anti-ship missiles. Add to all that the fact that permanent American military presence on Australian soil is now at a scale unprecedented since the Second World War. And you can see that the Australians are not slow walking the decision to prepare for a war. But the question that stands though is why now? Why is Australia doing all this now and what threat is so real that it forces their hand? What has China got to do with all of this and how the US and the UK are helping out? So in this video, let's answer all of those questions and understand the dangerous game that is geopolitics. Before starting, just a quick reminder to hit the like button below. These war related videos is something algorithm is not a fan of so your likes help out the video tremendously. So please take a quick second to hit the like button below and let's begin. When you think of big military powers, Australia doesn't immediately pop up on your radar. Sure, it's a huge country with a sizable population and considerable troops, but Australia doesn't really push itself into military acts outside of peacekeeping efforts. I mean, this is the nation that has more kangaroos than people after all. This time, however, all this has changed. With the United States and the UK as partners, Australia is increasing its military force quite substantially to present an unbeatable force. We'll soon talk about the multi-billion dollar military weapons acquisitions like F-35A Lightning aircraft and air-to-air -air missile in just few minutes. But for now, let's answer the why. What makes a relatively defense-centered nation start preparing itself for aggressive actions? Well, in Australia's case, the answer is Beijing. China has that effect. You must be asking yourself, how is Australia's biggest trading partner its most dangerous security threat? Well, let me explain. The first angle to look at this from, which many do, is the perspective that China is the problem. More accurately, China's military buildup is the direct problem. It's no secret that Beijing has been increasingly arming itself over the years, and with its already confrontational foreign policy, such actions increase the potential for military conflict in the region. Australia is a clear example. I mean, I would be looking at them funny if they were the only ones not increasing their military at a time that other nations are. As I said, this entire situation is intensified by the fact that China has been very aggressive in its handling of other nations. It would not be a far cry to outright call China a bully. 
China has a history of trying to bully other nations with trade sanctions. Its list of victims include Canada, Japan, Lithuania, Mongolia, Norway, the Philippines, South Korea, and Taiwan. I mean, if you don't believe me, take it from the US Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, who has outright called China's behavior and policy bullying. I will dive into the details in just a few minutes. But the TLDR of the whole situation is that when a bully begins to arm themselves, it is a big risk, isn't it? Especially when they do it 1200 miles away from Australia's borders like they are doing it with the Solomon Islands. The point is that Beijing's military buildup clearly puts Australia's interest in a position where matters become intense. So let's take a look at how this bullying has manifested against Australia. Time for a story with unexpected ending. It all started back in the pandemic days. In the early 2020, then Prime Minister Scott Morrison endorsed an inquiry into the origins of COVID-19, which somehow angered China. This reaction makes you wonder, why would China be angry if it had nothing to hide? Well, this was met with China's ambassador to Australia, warning Australia that it was treading a dangerous path and the Chinese may not wish to consume Australian products. It was followed up with action as China launched a campaign of economic coercion against Australia. Given that China was a huge consumer of Australian goods, the largest in fact, the CCP executives thought they had a crushing leverage. You see, Australia is rich in resources. I'm not talking about thousand things that can kill you down there. I'm talking about actual resources. Australia has a ton of them. China, on the other hand, as the manufacturing factory of the world, is a huge consumer of resources. This relationship between two nations has largely served them well. However, due to a deep desire to silence Australia and bully it into picking a more China-positive COVID position, China started to withhold its markets back in 2020 using made-up concerns about trade practices and pest infestations china suddenly stopped importing everything from australia resulting in a 16 billion dollar hit to australia's export economy this was meant to crumble the australian export industry as a retaliation for speaking out of turn what china didn't count on however was that as the home of multiple snakes and wipers Australia has over centuries evolved to adapt against snakes and wipers. Get it? Because China did some snake moves here? No? Fine. We'll move on. As China's boycotts of Australian goods began, Australia's economy was indeed reliant on China. Export to China accounted for 11% of outbound trade in 2005. But by 2020, this number stood at 37%. Mitigating its reliance, Australia's bet on China was chiefly a wager on international trade. Australia has relatively few multinationals that manufacture and sell inside China. But even without huge China-based subsidiaries, Australia was at risk. Australia's exposure to China stood at 8.2% of its GDP in 2020, which was double that of America and close to that of Germany. Luckily for Australia though, China's economy was just as reliant on Australia, if not more. That's what you get when you focus on attack and forget to look at mutual damage. China hurt itself as it tried to spank Australia. Classic. You see, some of the commodities such as Australian iron ore were so hard to replace that China chose to not target them at all. Also luckily, many of Australia's affected exporters found other markets. After China slapped an 80% tariff on Australian barley, its producers just started selling the barley to other Asian countries. Worse yet, Chinese beer makers had to buy other countries' barley, which was not as good. Naturally, this affected the quality of their product. Similarly, when China blocked shipments of Australian coal, it had to buy more from Russia and Indonesia. That left India and Japan short on their demand. So, Australia just sold it to them. Meanwhile, rising world prices made Australian miners lots of money. But the Australian pain was not insignificant. 
Industries that suffered the most were the lobster industry and the wine industry. Luckily for Australian politicians, their efforts to manage the crisis politically was greatly assisted by China's overreach. China's propaganda machine, fueled by CCP sentiment, fiercely denounced Australia, and almost all official contacts were frozen. November 2020, China's embassy in Australia made a public list of 14 grievances with countries' then-government ranging far beyond economic questions. China moaned that members of Australia's parliament were allowed it to criticize the Communist Party and the country's news outlet published unfriendly or antagonistic reporting on China. To all these complaints, Australia's Prime Minister basically replied, saying, that's just Australia being Australia. If you remember the headlines around the time of these events, the whole situation just made it seem like there was a blatant miscalculation from China. But luckily for CCP, the government change in Australia gave CCP an excuse to tactically back down. Since then, Prime Minister Albanese government has been careful not to infuriate China unnecessarily. The government has been actively dispelling talk of big win for the West as it claims to be respectful in dealing with China. Basically, the Australia's government is trying not to be a sore winner as to not make the situation worse. The idea from the Australian government is to disagree but cooperate and discuss the disagreements behind closed doors and don't amplify your differences publicly. For CCP, this was the best case scenario as they had to save face. But this doesn't mean Australia decided to take a knee. Australia understood its strengths and resisted demands to change laws, overturn investment bans, and muffle critics. Rather, under its previous and current government, it tied its security policy tighter to America through AUKUS. This trilateral submarine building pact also includes Britain and a policy of deterrence. It is also doing more diplomatically to counter China's influence in the Pacific. This is something I touched on earlier and will explain more in a minute. All in all, I have mentioned this entire economic saga to explain that the trade bans had backfired for China. This incident with Australia has been one of the more aggressive stances that Beijing has taken in recent times. But it's not the only one, unfortunately for most of its other opponents. China is too large a military power to oppose. And when China makes demands, well, it makes demands. In places like the South China Sea, the wrath and the aggression of China are much more visible. Hence, headlines like this and events like this. The fight over the South China Sea. China wants control of it, but other countries say they have rights to it too. To the Philippines now, where growing tensions with Beijing could see China's ambassador to the country expelled. It follows a new standoff in the disputed waters of the South China Sea. Foreign ministers of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations express concern over escalating tensions in disputed areas in the South China Sea. Security cooperation has also been on the agenda at the Tokyo summit. It comes amid heightened tensions between the Philippines and China in the South China Sea. These conflicts are problematic and they serve as a warning sign for Australia. Looking at this map here, you can easily see the several areas that might end up producing conflict between the two nations. Beijing's growing influence in the Pacific was made clear when it signed a security agreement with the Solomon Islands setting off alarm barrels in Australia that the deal could lead to a Chinese naval base being built. Having a Chinese military base so close to Australia is a security threat. I mean, that would place Chinese troops and naval warships less than 1200 miles from the Australian coast. That's a scary reality because if China were to provoke or be provoked by Australia, they have an army right outside. Knowing China, it ceases to be the matter of if and it becomes a matter of when. There have already been incidents in recent times. Just last year, Australia protested after a Chinese fighter jet cut across the nose of an Australian aircraft, patrolling international airspace over the South China Sea. That's a conflict source right there. In a similar incident in recent times, a Chinese J-16 flew dangerously close to a US Air Force plane. The US Defense Secretary told delegates that this incident was another troubling case of aggressive and unprofessional flying. These are the kind of acts that can escalate and spiral really quickly. This is why Australia has leaned heavily into its partnership with US, increasing the presence of the US in the region. 
But to most experts, it's clear that China's leaders won't be satisfied until the United States is kicked out of the region. China wants to be the big dog, the unquestionable authority. From this analytical starting point, it is hard to view China as anything other than an enduring national security threat to Australia. While it's always difficult to deduce the real strategic intentions of China's leader, Xi Jinping, it is easy to see that China clearly wants to become the only power in Asia. To Xi, the name of the game is power and exercise of that power. China has always thrived on controlling through economic power or intimidating through military power, and hence the worry that Australia now carries. This worry is actually widespread throughout the Australian population. Take a look at this quote taken from the Red Alert, a joint report of Australian newspapers. I think that about tells you everything you need to know about Australia's outlook and the reason it's preparing so much against Chinese aggression. Having resisted China, Australia now wants to make sure there is no chance of being intimidated militarily, hence their defensive actions. The question around national security has never sounded so interesting now, has it? If one country's actions consistently undermine the ability of sovereign states to make their own decisions and therefore threaten to make life permanently challenging for other people, then counteractions become necessary. This exact thinking is what has led to Australia's regional security being a top focus. Enter the AUKUS arrangement. I have mentioned this word a few times already, and you might be wondering what it is. So let's dive deeper. AUKUS is a new three-way strategic defense alliance between Australia, the UK, and the US. It was set up initially to build a class of nuclear-propelled submarines, but has now extended to include a military cooperation in Indo-Pacific region, same area where China is seen as an increasing threat. AUKUS is acting as a check on Chinese power, and basically, Australia has partnered with some of the big dogs to ramp up their security. This deal marks the first time the US has shared nuclear propulsion technology with an ally apart from the UK. This is a huge win for Australia. These types of submarines in this context have a longer range, are quicker, and harder to detect. On top of all that, former National Security Advisor of the United Kingdom has made it clear AUKUS is more than just a class of submarine. Describing the pact as perhaps the most significant capability collaboration in the world anywhere in the past six decades. He added that it was a project that has been in work for months. The US President Joe Biden also said that this was needed to maintain a free and open Indo-Pacific. This alliance is no joke. So it raises a question to China, is this deterrence or catalytic behavior? On one hand, we have AUKUS Alliance projecting so much strength that it aims to deter China's recklessness. Basically saying, don't even try anything because you're gonna lose. But on the other hand, China and its allies are looking at this as nations that are banding together against it. In a way, China feels like it's being cornered and you know what they say about a cornered wild animal. This debate actually goes farther than just AUKUS. The US has been making alliances all over the South China Sea and creating an island chain blockade around China. We have a full video on that strategy, but the point of mentioning this here is you can see how the lines between deterrence and catalytic behavior start to become quite blurred. So the question now becomes, how is Beijing responding to all this? Well, not well, as many of you probably guessed. Relations between the three allies and China were already at a low, and the AUKUS alliance only made it worse. A Chinese foreign minister spokesperson said that the three countries were in the grip of an obsolete Cold War zero-sum mentality and narrow-minded geopolitical concepts. On top of this, China also questioned Australia's commitment to nuclear non-proliferation. While the state-run Global Times which often takes a harder line than Chinese officials, said Australian troops are also most likely to be the first batch of Western soldiers who waste their lives in the South China Sea. That's quite a threat. But on the Australia side, statements like that only incentivize their military buildup even further. 
So, through August, Australia is set to acquire a fleet of up to 8 nuclear submarines, forecast to cost up to $368 billion between now and mid-2050s. In the short term, Australia will spend $9 billion over the next four years. It's quite an expensive joining fee to be part of the only now seven countries in the world with this technology. These countries include the US, the UK, Russia, India, France, China, and now Australia. With AUKUS at play now, China faces a new powerful defense alliance in the Indo-Pacific, one that has been welcomed by regional partners such as Japan. It also gives Biden focus for his post-Afghanistan tilt to Asia. But Australia's decision to arm itself rather intensely has not been without cost. For starters, it has shifted China's perception of Australia as a benign middle power with no real means to something distinctly darker and more impactful. But it was a decision that reflected Australia's reality. For decades, Australia felt reassured that its geographical remoteness and the limited ability of neighbors to project power offered it a 10-year window to prepare for any conflict. But the rise of a muscular China under President Xi Jinping and advances in long-range missile technology have destroyed those assumptions. Couple this with North Korea's nuclear ambitions, and you can see why Australia is spending billions in defense. It's true that all this is costing Australia a pretty penny, but the cost of inaction should China succeed in getting what it wants simply became too serious to ignore.